Thank you for joining us today for Pat Gorman's Hard Money Watch. I'm Sinclair No, in for Pat Gorman. And today we have a very special guest. I always look forward to the opportunity to talk with Bob Chapman. Bob Chapman, the editor and publisher of The International Forecaster. Bob Chapman comes to us with years of trading experience, years of writing about the markets as well. Started writing back in the 60s and then about 20 years ago, took over writing and editing The International Forecaster. Uh, the International Forecaster is now found all around the world and provides some unique insight. Uh, there are twice weekly editions of the Forecaster, and you can find out more at theinternationalforecaster.com. That's the website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Uh, if you've heard Bob Chapman in the past, uh, stick around. You know what's coming up. Uh, the next hour, you're going to be glued to the radio. If you haven't heard Bob Chapman before, I think you're in for a treat. Good morning, Bob. How are you? I am fine, and it's very nice to be here again. <clears throat> I better clear my throat first. Yeah, we've got some talking <laughs> to do. I don't know do. where that frog came from. <laughs> anyway, I'm very happy to be here. Always a pleasure, sir. There is so much for us to talk about. We will open up the phones and, of course, take uh, questions from listeners. But I want to start with asking you a little bit, because I know you, you, you have been following the situation in Greece um, extensively. And this past week, it looked as if maybe there is some sort of a resolution. Uh, they came up with a disorderly default, but then they said maybe there's a default in there for credit default swap purposes of a little bit on the side. It's as if they wanted to do the disorderly default issue new bonds, and yet at the same time say that credit default swaps are not just worthless pieces of paper. I, I'm, sh I'm not sure I quite follow what they've done. What they've done, the uh, sellers of credit default swaps, which are insurance policies, they have decided, per their previous announcement, that, that all of this wasn't going to be covered. Uh, they change their mind, and they're doing partial covering. They're talking in terms of $3 billion. They had to do that, because if they didn't do that, it'd be out of business. Who's going to work with a bookmaker or a lender <laughs> who says, we're going to change the rules this week, and you're not going to collect? Don't ask us why. Just shut up and do what we tell you to do. And that's really where they were. Yeah. So they had to do something. But that number is not $3 billion. The total number was seven to seventy-five uh, billion. You cut it in half because you get two sides of the trade. I think the losses are going to be somewhere around $30 billion, and you won't find out until six months to a year after it's over that, that in fact, of what the numbers were. And, of course, the Federal Reserve, which they own, these major banks in New York City, they're going to give them the money to pay off. But they haven't told you that yet. Now, as far as the deal itself, first of all, they broke the law. They don't care. They make the rules. They do anything they want. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Greece does not have enough money in the new bailout to last this more than a year. Why? Because the people aren't cooperating. Nobody's paying any taxes. There's no revenue to speak of coming in. In fact, uh, in January, spending rose 8.5%. Um, receipts and revenues were off 4.5%. Now, uh, how do you operate? Never mind pay anybody off on the interest and the capitalization or bonds that you have. You can't. Now, they had said, so, though, that this, this would... this is a Mickey Mouse... Well, I think the best thing uh, to, to compare it to is um, a Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> For those of you who remember the comic strips uh, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, Rube Goldberg could put anything together to make it work. And that's what they've done. 
So they bought some more time. Maybe they get lucky and get a year and a half. They'll be back doing the same thing over again, and they know it. Now, the only reason I've done what they've done is the bankers want to keep it all together because they have uh, the dream of world government. And that supersedes everything else. They should have allowed Greece to go under three years ago when I was on the radio and television and uh, and editorials in Greece. And so they didn't do it. They will do it. Just be patient. And all the rest of them will follow. And I think the euro is doomed. Well, this is part of the next question is, will the others follow? But before we get there, what does this mean for the people in Greece? Um, some of the reports that I've heard are that situation is, is really very unpleasant now. Well, they've already cut salaries within the government around 35%. They're going to cut them again another 20%. Pensions already got cut about 40%. They're going to cut them another 20 now, how are these people going to live? They are using a currency they can't control. Their sovereignty is gone. And let that be a lesson to the rest of them. And they can't devalue. They should devalue 50 or 60%. They can't compete. Mm-hmm. And so it's just only a matter of time. Is this a and blueprint so, for the rest of Europe and for us as well? Yes, I would say that, generally speaking, is a salient commentary. So next up, probably Portugal, then Spain and Italy. Don't forget Ireland. They're having another referendum. And have they got any brains in Ireland whatsoever? And talk about the Republic. Southern Ireland. Hmm. They will rescind the political deal made between the Alpha Group, which owned the banks, which just happens to be the Illuminati, just happens to be the royal families of Europe. They let them off the hook on all of their losses, and the Republic of Ireland assumed them. I mean, like, what insanity is that? So hopefully the referendum will say, no, we're not going to do that anymore. And go ahead and default. They've got absolutely nothing to lose. Seems as if default actually is a preferred method. I mean, if you look at uh, if you look at Argentina, you look at Iceland, a couple of the more recent examples, default is painful, but doesn't last that long. Well... In these cases, Argentina is a semi-example because they went 70% right off, 30% payback. And that's not good enough. Uh, These these countries are really buried. And the solvent countries that lent them the money, they knew what they were doing. They knew they couldn't pay back. The banks knew they couldn't pay back. Well, that brings us then to the next round of Federal Reserve accommodation. Uh, There has been a debate going back and forth over whether we would see QE3 or not. And uh, one day it sounds as if Fed Chairman Bernanke is on Capitol Hill and saying there will be no QE3. Um, and then a few days later, there's a form of QE3, although not called QE3. Um, looks as if the Federal Reserve is this year going to be shoveling money out of the uh, helicopters and directly into the housing market. Um, but it does look, I would think, and, and your opinion on this, Bob, is this the form of QE3 that we're going to be seeing this year? Is, is a jolt for the housing market not called QE3? Well, there's two of them. The first one is the twist. Mm-hmm. And actually, they're operating as QE3. Have been for several months. 
and it will continue to do so by selling the short end of the Treasury market and buying the long end. That's so they can bring rates down and hopefully bring the 30-year fixed rate mortgage down to 3.5% to qualify more people. And, see, they know things that the public doesn't know. And one of them is that the inventory out there is going to end up two years from now probably being about 9.8 million homes. They're going to start bundling these homes to Fannie and Freddie Hall, which is about 500,000. And they're going to put them in groups of a billion at a time. That's what they're worth, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And they're going to auction them. And then the buyers, who will be hedge funds and other institutions, because uh, I don't know anybody who has a billion dollars that can go do that. And, of course, you can't because you don't have that kind of money. No. And so what happens next is they take them, they fix them up, and they rent them. Then they put them into REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts. That's the way they're going to try to get rid of some of them. But, you know, 500,000 homes is okay. But how about the other 9.3 million that we'll have over the next two years? And, you know, the lenders, banks, they have been the ones who have been servicing and relieving the lower end of the market. Uh, that's probably homes that originally, from say four hundred thousand down, with are now worth two hundred or thereabouts. <clears throat> what they're going to do is start the banks now. Uh, they're going to start foreclosing on these homes that are worth that were worth from four hundred thousand to forty million, whatever, and they're coming on the market, and they have not been on the market before. So what does that mean? It means we get flooded it means with the homes. prices of more expensive homes are going to come down shortly more steeply than the lower-priced homes, which are already off 50%. You know, I, I see the numbers out there, 35%. And if you take the whole country, maybe that's correct. <clears throat> but the point is the smaller, less expensive homes will probably come off another 10 or 20%, but the big ones, they're coming off more. Okay. Uh, we have more to talk about, of course, with Bob Chapman. Bob Chapman is the editor of The International Forecaster. You can find out more about The International Forecaster at theinternationalforecaster.com. If you have a question or comment for Bob Chapman... 602-324-1510. We open up the phone lines at 602-324-1510. Let me also remind you that coming up April 27th and 28th, Wealth Protection 2012. This year's version of Wealth Protection will take place at the Embassy Suites in Tempe once again. And once again, we're pleased to announce that Bob Chapman will be joining us via teleconference. Uh, on Friday, the 27th, I believe, is when you're scheduled, Bob. And last year you gave us some great information, just phenomenal. And, and I was watching the uh, the audience in attendance, and literally we were spellbound. I'm sure it's going to be that way again because it's always that way. But we look forward well, to it. Well, get, uh, get the questions from the public. Uh, that's that's the, uh, the main uh, gist of the program. And we want to know what they want to know that they don't know already. Well, so you're going to be doing questions from the audience again. Yeah. Fantastic. Somebody collect them ahead of time and just bing, bang, bong. Okay. That's what we'll do. And we'll be taking questions today, this morning, right now, at 602-324-1510. If you have a question for Bob Chapman, give us a call. 602-324-1510. This is Pat Gorman's Hard Money Watch. 
This is Hard Money Watch with Pat Gorman on Money Radio 1510. 